Hello everyone and welcome to this really special video. Rather than being in the book cupboard, we are joined by a very special guest. Very special. Very special. Very special. The writer of When the Wasp Strand, Claire Whitfall. <laughs> and uh, Claire has joined us all the way from Berlin. Wow. Well, you got here by? The uh, Berlin to Kenneth Express. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> just one train. By train. Amazing. So, um, one train all the way. It's a big demand for that one. And what happened was, um, you listened to our podcast? I did. I heard the podcast and I was so inspired by what great teachers you were. Oh, wow. And I went back to you and now here we are. That's right. So um, we're going to use this opportunity to ask you a few questions that we believe the nation will want to know. Mm. The so. world. In fact. <laughs> the world. The world. But before I do, I just want to plug this book. Oh, what's that? It's a really good book of short stories. It's called The Loudest Sound and Nothing. And who is it by? It's by Claire Whitfall. It's oh. available wherever books are sold. I want one. And I, and I tell you what, let's be honest now. Okay. We've read this. Yes, we have. And it is brilliant. I haven't quite finished yet, but I want to. It is absolutely brilliant. And um, it's pretty cheap. So pick up this book and see the rest of Claire's amazing work. This book took you how long to write, Claire? Nine years. Nine years. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. So it's a lot of hard slog. Mm. <laughs> Definitely. Right, we're going to ask you some questions. Great. My first question is, well done on having a Wikipedia page. That's great. It's <laughs> not a question. That's not, no, that was the, oh. the prelude Sorry. to the question. The question is, this is a quote from your Wikipedia page. Mm -hmm. At age 21, Faber and Faber offered her a book contract based on reading a single story she had written. Is that true and, and how did that happen? Um, it, it is essentially true, although uh, they read one story that um, my younger brother had come up to my university class and was just uh, visiting for the day and an editor from Faber had come to the class and my little brother gave him a story that I had written mm -hmm. and he read that on the train home and then they called me up and said if they got anything more they could read. So they did actually read two other short stories before they opened oh. the contract, they were just testing it, but um, essentially yes it is true. How did that feel? <laughs> um, pretty amazing, but at the same time, at the time, I didn't realise quite how unusual that was in terms of getting a, a publishing deal. I just thought that was how they found books. And only sort of realised with time that I was really extremely fortunate. Uh, but yes, it was, it was, it was a good thing <laughs> to, to get, certainly. And the end result is, is that's this. the book. That is the book that they commissioned, yes. Awesome. Although they didn't know what it was going to be when they commissioned it. That is amazing. Winner of the BBC National Short Story Award. It was. <laughs> Good book. You heard it here. Mr. Hayne. Um, Claire, who are your major literary influences and why? Um, lots. There's lots. There's so many authors who have influenced me. I read a huge amount. Um, always have read a huge amount. Um, I was talking with your students today that Salinger was a big influence, J.D. Salinger. I, I love the sort of simplicity of his style, you know, it's got mm. a lot of resonance to it. So he was an author I started reading quite early on, and it's still I read him and, and oh, yes. still think his work's really amazing. Um, I didn't really read many short stories, oh. actually, um, Salinger's a little but not many others uh, while I was writing the book, which is a bit strange perhaps, mm. but um, it was only later that I sort of came to short stories sort of nearing the completion of the book, and then found that they were just totally amazing. Um, oh. I'm really glad that two of you now seem to be inspired by yeah, short stories. Yeah, we are inspired. <laughs> we are Wigful fans and yes. short story fans. Yes. And also having a dabble ourselves, aren't we now? A they dabble yeah, short yeah, stories, yeah, yes. Yeah, it's great. Dipping it's our toe great. in the pond. Yeah. Well, yeah. But what's the writing? Oh, no. <laughs> OK, the story, When the Wasps Drowned, um, the title does not address the major event no. of the story. I won't spoil it for anyone who's, who's not read it, but... Press pause now and, and, and read it, then come <laughs> You don't back. want to know the football results. Yeah, spoiler, spoiler, alert, spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. alert. Um, I would have given... <laughs> now I will do a spoiler. Then why not call it, The day we dug up a dead body in our garden. Yeah. Why not? Why when the wasps Well. Dropped? <coughs> yeah, I mean, even the story, the way it begins, she's talking about that summer, but she talks about all the other things before mm. she even gets on to mentioning the incident related to right. the body in the garden. 
Um, and that for me was because the story, although that's obviously the sort of the, the crucial event of that summer, what she's remembering is the fact that that summer was the summer when she really started to come of age and, and to be on that cusp of childhood and adulthood. And that's what I wanted to explore in that story. Um, and the incident with the body is, is almost sort of secondary to that. Or I wanted to kind of veil the action so that, uh, also so it comes as a surprise, because if I put it in the title, yeah. it wouldn't be much fun when you're reading the story. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And that is a theme that seems to carry on through all of your stories, this, mm -hmm. um, the things you don't say, the things that we as the reader have to work out, and we yeah. become, you know, like the characters in the story, trying to piece it together. So I think that's something we've enjoyed, isn't definitely, it? Definitely, definitely. Yeah. I'd like to ask Claire, out of all of your short stories, why do you think the AQA chose when the wasps drowned to be included? Because there are many that would be as enjoyed by the students. Why, why that one? I suppose because it's got a young narrator. Or, mm. or, or, I mean, she's older when she's telling the story, but I mean, yeah. the action the story, she's quite young. So, could relate so to I, I think probably they thought students could relate to that and also to what she's talking about. Her, sure. You know, experiences in life, not finding a body in the garden, which most people don't experience, but, mm -hmm. you know, growing up is an experience which, which everybody has to do. Mm. And so I think they assume that they. And I think it's true. Mm -hmm. uh, the response I've got from students is that they can relate to that right. and uh, sort of get something from seeing how someone's explored that. Brilliant. Good, yeah. Yeah. Was that your question? That was my that was question. Your yeah, question. It's your turn now. Okay. So we're alternating. Slightly um, answered in your previous answer, mm -hmm. but what inspired the story and does it have a factual basis at all? No real factual basis, um, but it, it's semi-autobiographical in that I'm also the oldest of three siblings, and I think it was my way of sort of um, looking at the relationship one has as an older sibling. Um, and as you'd identified in the podcast as well, although it's not set in the summer of 76, I was born in the summer of 76, okay. and so that had definitely influenced the story, being yeah. being conscious of that as being a summer that, so you were right that about something. for the weather was, we were. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <coughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so it's sort of the summer of 76 in 1986 or something. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah imagining that could have happened. Mm. But yeah, so, so that was factual, and that there was this very, very long hot summer, and I wanted that to kind of pervade the story. So it does, doesn't um, it? That's yeah. so it comes across. Yeah. A lot of clues. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. brilliant. Oh, um, it's my turn. It's your turn. We alternate. I'm not good at maths. We alternate. Sorry, I'm not an alternator. Um, many of your stories involve either broken parental relationships or single parent, or even when parents are together, one is sort of absent from the story and not there. Yeah. Is, are you conscious of that? Is that something you intentionally do, or yeah. is there a reason? Yeah. It wasn't something I consciously did. Right. It's certainly true. It's certainly there. Yeah. And I've had other... other um, people who've commented on it and it sort of surprised me in a way because I, my parents are still together to this day and are very oh, happy and so I came from a very, uh, a very stable yeah. family background but maybe, I don't know, I think sometimes I try to sort of, things that I don't experience I want to kind of imagine right. that and sort of, you know, get a sense of what it would be like. In this story, I think it, it's important because the absence of the father meant that Evelyn had to really grow up I much see. faster. Yeah. Um, and she's got this real maturity and independence which has been sort of forced upon her because mm -hmm. the mother's you know, working so hard to support mm -hmm. the, the three kids. So she's not really there. And I think if uh, maybe the mother had been more around, Evelyn wouldn't have had to grow up like that. Yeah. So it was important here for that. Brilliant. <coughs> we both said brilliant. Brilliant. So it's like, let's be <laughs> prolific. 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 Great minds think alike. <laughs> and also weird ones. Yes. Um, I know a question a lot of students have, have asked them mm -hmm. on their first reading is why didn't the children react to finding yeah. the body? So if mm -hmm. I found a, a dead body in my garden, I would phone the police, mm -hmm. um, scream, cry. Yeah. You know, run around. And they just cover it up. And they, uh, yeah, and, and she thinks for a bit, 
covers it up, and it, you know, so there's a silent understanding between the siblings as well. Yeah, then, yeah. yeah. That they're going to keep mum about this. They're not going to talk not, about this. Be, there's no conversation. Mm, they they just all have this again. silent agreement that nothing's and said. Likewise, when it's the police unusual. come, you know, at that point, you're imagining they would say, "Oh yeah, well actually, there, you know, that that could possibly be linked to." What, yeah. what we found, but but nothing, and not even nothing, but the hiding of the ring. Yeah. So not yeah, we're not going to tell you, but we're going we're to withhold evidence. So what's yeah. that all about? Yeah, that was really interesting because um, when I was writing the story, I didn't really think about that too much, and I think it was because for myself, if I were Evelyn at that age, I probably would have done exactly the same thing. Mm. I was that kind of child that if there was something that I didn't really understand or was, fri or was frightened of, I would just kind of close myself off for it, from it and try to, you know, actually it didn't exist. And, uh, and so I think I probably would have done exactly that mm -hmm. and just covered it up and not, okay, right, I'm not going to mention that one. Um, and I didn't really think about the fact that that was quite an odd reaction <coughs> until I started uh, sharing it with school groups <laughs> and, and, and getting a response and suddenly found most people were saying well, that, why didn't they tell anyone? Um, but I guess also it emphasises this sort of complicity between the, the siblings that, yeah. that they they have this secret that they're sharing, and that draws them together in a way that it wouldn't have done if they, mm. if they shared it yeah. with the world. So in defence of Evelyn, I always thought that their house was like their castle, mm -hmm. and in a way they're at home. And if she's under fourteen, there's it's, there's a tricky problem with not being old enough to look yeah. after the younger ones, yeah. and maybe she's keeping the police away. Yeah, maybe. Regardless of the body, because yeah. she doesn't want her mum to get in trouble for leaving yeah. them oh. unsupervised, yeah, and that's yeah, why she want keeps more quiet. To be <coughs> you know, it's, it's a case yeah. of, you know, yeah. their family comes first despite the awful discovery. Mm, that could be just I thought that could, just, you know, that could be a defensive thing we could say yeah. for her. Because I found that funny because, you know, she, she says to the police officers, um, you know, my mum's at work, she won't be back till six. She gives it right away, yeah. And they sort of say, okay, and you yeah, think, over it. why would they say, you know, it's almost like, I guess their, um, you know, their job is they're investigating the disappearance, yeah. so they might think, oh, there's a, you know, there's a story there, but I'm not going to dig into it. Good, good point. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, I mean, um, also, this is, this, <coughs> I think maybe nowadays it would be, um, you know, let, you'd be less likely to leave young children at home on their own, and perhaps in that era, in the sort of early 80s, it perhaps would be quite so un un world, yeah. yeah, Although not yeah. because of Mr. Mordecai. Yeah, they're not in there still. And I've got to ask you this, really off script, if it's got this kind of, um, you know, factual basis, so mm -hmm. in the sense that you were the, the oldest, yeah. the eldest sister, two younger siblings, Similar names as well, Tyler, Tristan, there's a, there's a yeah. naming thing, isn't there? And, um, you know, and, and you identify that quite clearly, you know, with your, yourself. Were you ever suspicious then of, of the neighbours around you, the people around you? Are you... Yeah. No. So they, they just, there's <laughs> no, nothing in No, I, and I, I lived in a flat, so we didn't oh. even have a... We had downstairs neighbours, but not oh. next door neighbours. Um, no, I don't think we ever had any... Mm. So the similarities end there and the rest. Yeah, yeah. So I have the next one maybe that attacked a wasp nest with a blowtorch. Yeah. That really happens. <laughs> that is true. So that's quite close. Yeah. It's wasps at least. But then in a sense you didn't write the story. Claire did. <laughs> but I could write about him and his blowtorch. When the wasps burned. Yeah. <laughs> the, the chilling the sequel. sequel. <laughs> yeah. Mordecai yeah. returns. When the wasps were fried. With a blowtorch. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. There's a story in that. Over to you. Um, well, um, this is out of the story now. It's really um, a question for aspiring writers, perhaps young yeah. youngsters reading a story in the anthology. What advice would you give a, a young writer whose aspirations were be to become an author like yourself full time? How would they go about maybe well, building a career? Okay, well, the first thing I say is just read lots. Like, read lots mm -hmm. and lots and lots and lots. Um, I mean, I. I Always read all the time when I was a child. It's right. kind of a weird nerdy little no, child. Uh, you want read to do the all same the time. Um, yeah. Then I went to university and I, I studied literature and just read sometimes almost a book a day. Um, wow. But I got you know I learned a huge amount about how to write and ways to write mm. and what one can do in writing by reading. So that's really really important. Um, and also just to do it uh, to really be practicing at it because. Mm. Uh, it's a very strange thing with writing, and I find this with adult inspiring writers as well, that 
um, they sort of had this idea that just writing is something that something that one innately can do, which to an extent is true. true. You know, I think everybody can write, but at the same time, to do it well, you need to keep working at it. And you wouldn't assume that you could pick up the violin and just play it instantly no. without no. having practiced and learned how to to play scales and everything in the same. You wouldn't expect you could run a marathon without having done all the training. Mm. And it's the same with writing. You know, you, you're not just going to sit down and write something no. perfect just like that. You've got to really work and work and work and learn how to do it and learn through doing. So just uh, start writing things and so experiment, time. you know. Uh, if there are authors that inspire you, try writing like them. For right. Just try see how they do what they do and you'll learn from that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because you don't want to just write like someone else, no. you want to find your own but voice. But you can find that by trying out things and just yeah, experiment a lot. There's a like, case there's of no really, rules of now they've got the time at school they can... And while they're being taught as well as yeah. reading, it's, this is the time maybe for the groundwork to go in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah brilliant. Yeah. Now, one of the things um, we found when we did the podcast, mm -hmm. and we thought, wouldn't it be great if you listened to it, was your, um, you're quite an elusive character, aren't you? <laughs> so you, you don't have a website. No. Uh, you've got a MySpace page which you now no longer I use. <laughs> You're not on Twitter. Um, not on Twitter. Don't you. even have Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that, no, that's all right. Facebook. <laughs> I don't have Facebook. Um, but I'm just thinking in terms of not people who want to contact you, but people who are, you know, oh, hey, that's a, an interesting writer. Yeah. Obviously, they can buy the loudest sound of nothing. Mm. What's that again? Sorry, what's the loudest that? sound of ah, nothing. It is a collection of short stories. Right. This book um, is quite a small book, is but is there is so much in here that I would say you would you could read a story a day. That there's a there's about a month's really good reading in here. Not the sort of book you read straight off. You could have read, no. read one, then contemplate it. Absolutely, it, it makes you think. You actually want to just to put it down and think about what you've read. This was a new experience for me. I actually just plough through things. That's right, because you're a farmer. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> but also, if you want to be a writer, this is a great book to read because it is incredibly well written. And I'm not just saying that, you know... It will make you read in a different style. That's right. And I've also written in lots of styles, hmm. which again was through... You have. It was my There's way voices in here. Yeah. You would be a welcome addition to our podcast. But that was also why I was, kind of, I was learning while I was doing it. And hmm. I was learning by trying out different things. So you've got this, you've got a children's book I have, yes. called Where's My Chihuahua. Yeah. Has anyone seen my chihuahua? Has anyone seen my chihuahua? <laughs> well, I haven't, I haven't seen it. Uh, no, I haven't seen it. I can't help there. Yeah. Um, That's a quick read. <laughs> yeah, 12, <laughs> 12 pages. pages. <laughs> Tell the audience how long the 12 page um, children's story That was took two to three years working on that one. <laughs> you, you are an, a, a perfectionist. Sort of perfectionist. Yeah. Yes. But apart from the, the two books you've got then, what can people do if they are, you know, want to sort of follow you and know more of what you're doing and that sort of thing? Oh, that's a tough question, isn't question. it? Because you're yeah. thinking, I don't know. Yeah, no, because I, I was, I was, for a while I had a blog for Book Trust, which I think is still there archived, so if you want, if people are interested, they can go back and look at the archive of that. Um, but I, I also learnt in the process that I'm not a blogger, so uh, I don't... Because <laughs> I can imagine that each day would take you about three weeks to write. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, that's not my, um, my natural medium, I don't think. Um, but I enjoyed writing it, and I'm glad that I did it. Uh, and it's a nice sort of body of, you know, just thoughts there. Um, and that's got lots of advice, actually, for writers and, uh, of, you know, how to write stories, how to write children's books, all of that. Oh, that's the one to look for. Yeah. for the archive. Um, so yes. yeah, the archive on the Book Trust website. Mm. Excellent. Um, and also, oh, I don't know. Okay. Keep an eye out for any future. Any Maybe a Claire Wigfall app on your phone that will beep when the next book's out. <laughs> yes. Just to let you know. You might it wait. Beep it might be nine years. It might be nine years and a couple of phone <laughs> updates in the process, but it will be at some point. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. I'm, are you happy with that? I'm happy with it. Well, thank you very much, um, Claire, for coming to our school today, for working with us, and for this interview. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Should we all wave? Let's wave. Bye, Bye. for you.